Good day everyone. On today's episode, we are going to discuss what makes a really good catch can. So what makes a good oil separator? What is the best catch can out there? Well, in order to find that out, you have to understand how a catch can works. We're going to discuss it. You can see here, I got a few catch cans. Here's one here. Here's another one uh, right over there. You guys may know who makes these. You may, you may not. Anyway, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the properties and characteristics of what makes a really good catch can. Now, where did I get all this information? Well, I didn't just pull it out of my butt. I did a bunch of research, SAE articles, university engineering research papers, and even examining patents from Yamaha, Porsche, General Motors, Toyota. I'm gonna go over some of those things. I'm gonna throw them all up on the screen so we can go over it all together. And then at the end of this video, hopefully if you're in the market for a catch can for your car, A, you will know uh, you know, if it's a good one and B, well, you shouldn't get ripped off because then you don't have to worry about marketing and stuff like that. All you have to worry about is the design and you will be able to know if it's a good catch can or not based on its design. And they're actually fairly simple products. They've been around forever. If you go back a few generations, people were actually using similar type devices to separate steam. And you know, we'll go over those too, just a little bit. And the reason I wanna go over those is you'll see the properties that are incorporated into that technology is very similar of these catch cans that are made right today. And it's really, it's really not that hard. So I don't wanna go over anybody's head, so I'll take it a little bit slow, but yet at the same time, I don't want this video to drag. Okay, so let's take a look at the size of this pollution chart. And here we can see oil vapors are between 0 0.01 and one micron. So that is really the size that we have to be targeting. Now the human eye can see in the order of about 40 microns. That's the smallest a human eye can see. And why am I saying that? Because you'll notice on some catch cans, you actually have these filters that filter up to 40 microns. Now we just learned that is way too big, which means that these filters are actually going to be ineffective and they are inside some cheap catch cans. Here's another style of the filter. This one's five microns, but you know what? Five microns is still too big. So I did go on a BMW forum and you know what? I did a little bit of research, found someone using this type of catch can and you know what? Surprise, surprise. They didn't catch any oil with it, but more importantly, there was a problem with the filter getting clogged. So I guess when there was some humidity in the can, uh, it froze and it actually created a problem. So that's huge. So how are we going to do our filtration? What's the best way? Well, it's actually mechanical which is quite interesting. So direct interception, inertial impaction, and diffusion. Those are the three ways you want to separate particles. And in a nutshell, what does that mean? Yeah, that's what it means. So let's talk about can design. So we'll use the cylindrical can design because that is the most common. And if we look at can design, we can see there's radial outlets and tangential outlets. Now, there is a big difference and the tangential outlet is actually much more efficient. And you can see here, because there's not as much of a pressure differential, so what that does is it keeps particles in contact with the can longer. Now when we look inside the catch can, a longer inner tube means more droplets are absorbed. So what that does is it reaffirms the fact that the flow has a more direct impact on walls and particles are more likely to get captured by walls leading again to a higher efficiency. And if we look at a Ford product here, okay, now this isn't a catch can. What this is though, it is a separator for an AC unit in a Ford, I think it was an Escape. I took it out of an Escape, but you could see it's got a very long center portion and it's actually pretty much hitting the bottom here. And if we take a look at the bottom, we can see there's four little notches, okay? I threw up arrows so you can see it. And the center part here, I'm gonna show you here, we'll throw up a magnifying glass here, it's got notches that allow it to click into the bottom. Now what that does is it allows it to get so tight to the bottom that you have a change in airflow. And what that does is it encourages that collision of particles. So if we take a look at this catch can and we wanna see how far the air actually has to travel from inlet to outlet, it's more than just a few inches. And we can see that by taking it apart. So if I take it apart right here, you can see, okay, it's fairly close to the bottom, which is good. And now if we take a quick measurement, we can see it's got to come through the top, go through the cylinder part, and then it comes back up here all along the wall. So just from here to here is about three inches. And then you're going to double it because you're going to have to go back in through here and through the top. So it's actually over, over that distance. So probably about seven inches of air travel, which is pretty decent. So it can't just come in and escape. It's forcing it through a path. Now we can see here on this catch can, there's not very much of a path at all. 
And the same with this catch can. There's almost no path. So why is a torturous path very important? Well, if we look at patents, we can see that's what the manufacturers are doing in their oil separator design. Here's a Honda patent. Now this uh, intake manifold is actually on a lot of Acuras uh, for anyone that does work on Acuras. And if we look at a Porsche one, we can see here where the air just has to keep changing directions. Here's Toyota and they create a really uh, elaborate path for the air to keep changing direction. And here's just another shot of it, just from the side. Now if we look at Toyota's patent, we can actually see they even say in their patent that they want the oil to be separated as much as possible from the blow by gas. So that is so important. Now let's take a look at our old steam separators again. Now here we can see we have no mesh. And the reason I wanted to bring these up is most catch cans have mesh, but they operate at a different flow. So no mesh means small pressure drop. But keep in mind, these are steam separators and they work at much different pressures. But why I'm bringing them up is to show you all they're doing is simply changing direction to encourage those particles to be hitting the walls and separate. So that's why I'm throwing those up. So in summary, what do we have to look at? Well, size. So you want to have a decent sized catch can uh, to promote contact with the surface area because the more surface area, the better chance you have at removing particles from the flow. And you want to have a torturous path. The more air change you have, the better. So you want directional change. It's just, it's very good. It promotes inertial impaction. Really, really good. You want that central tube close to the bottom because once again, it increases path length and directional change. Now the tangential outlet, well, there's not a lot of catch cans that actually have that. And it's probably due to manufacturing issues. The only catch can I found that actually has it is a Provent and that's a plastic catch can. And that's probably how they were able to manufacture that. So that's the video. Hopefully you're going to take something away from it. Uh, if you have any questions, comments like that, leave them below. Like I said, I always engage in constructive, uh, you know, discussions. I enjoy this kind of stuff. If you have any questions, uh, what more can I say? I don't want to repeat myself anymore. So have a good one. That's it. Garage King over and out. Take care, everyone. We'll see you on the next one.